Now, here's a man who's been through a lot. Brett Chateau. Welcome, Brett. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Now, you were raised in the Riverland. Whereabouts? In Renmark, not, not too far from Broken Hill. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. And you became a copper here. I did. I, I moved to the Big Smoke um, back when I was 17. Uh, back in, in those days, your parents prepared you to, to leave home. So mm. I was uh, well equipped with a tin twin tub washing machine and uh, <laughs> a few a few handy dishes like uh, apricot chicken, that type of stuff. Apricot and chicken, yes. It was, it was a, a very common recipe for people batching, wasn't it? It certainly was. Mm. Uh, I lived on it for a while and I, I never ate it again. Um, <laughs> Um, have you? There's a lot of trauma in being a, a policeman, isn't there? Look, there certainly is, and you know, I suppose when you go into the force as a, as a young person, you, know, you look at your own children at, at around the same age, and, and you shudder to think how they they might cope with the same sort of trauma that uh, you do get to see as a police officer. Did you have to do that? You know, that knock on the door um, to say someone had you know lost a child, Brett. Yes, uh, did, did that, the death messages, and uh, also at uh, accident scenes. I had one where um, the mother suspected that it was her son and uh, wow. approached the, the scene, and, and it was um, her son. So ter terrible things. Then that happened to you so sadly, Brett, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, look, it did. Uh, 16th of March, um, way back in 2001. Um, the day I'll never forget. It's uh, mm. My son Jordan um, was hit by a car up the top of Baines Road at Pringer Hills. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's something that you, you learn to live with, but uh, it's something that stays etched in your mind mm. for the rest of your days. The hardest thing in the world to lose a child. It is. It gets you thinking about children and, and how old they get to, and it, just, it doesn't matter as a parent. It's just, when they're your child, it doesn't matter how old they are, it's still your children and it's not the natural order of things. And you also have another of your children with uh, liver issues. Yeah, primary sclerosing cholangitis. So we've mm. had a, a, a few stints in hospital and a couple of superbugs. With, uh, what we were told was 40% mortality and uh, mm. hoping the, the bug would... Uh, um, be hit by the antibiotics, and otherwise having to let nature take its course. So, yeah, they're they're tough times as a parent. And you lost a partner to uh, to cancer. Oh. Yes, business business partner. Mm -hmm. um, um, recently married and uh, pregnant, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer at thirty, and she died at thirty two. Mm. So, it, it's everywhere. How do you deal with this, Brett? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a good question, and it's one that I've thought about for a long time. I obviously do a lot of reading, mm. um, talk to a lot of people. Um, sometimes you're, you're just uh, trying to, to cope, and, and you know, people look at you and wonder you know, what's going on in your brain. And uh, but sometimes there's just the little reminders that happen mm. that take you back. And mm. I think it's a, it's a matter of, I, I don't know, I think some people... It, have different different levels of resilience and um, I, I don't know why um, I've been able to cope and uh, many would say that I haven't and mm. I suppose that I am the person today because of those things but I, mm. I've, I've always sort of come back to it, not with Jordan so much when he was nine but it could be worse and I always that's my mantra it could be worse and I try and I try and level my thought process this is by imagining something else that uh, would be worse than the current situation, and um, sometimes it's a bit of a struggle to find those things. Mm. Um, grief is, is uh, all pervasive. It's you know one of the great themes of our time, Brett. Every second novel you seem to read nowadays is about a grief. I don't know quite why, but um, we deal with grief differently, and 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 we we build resilience differently, as you've suggested, don't we? What, how did you get to this resilience? Do you know? Look, uh, I have no idea. It's, mm. I suppose it's just waking up, not wishing you woke up the day after some of these things happen, mm. um, but being, you know, in some cases, forced to stay um, because you've got other children and mm. eventually that, that time, it doesn't heal, but it just allows you to perhaps see 
you know, cracks in the, the darkness where a little bit of light comes in and where you know you might not want to go out and enjoy yourself or have a have a have a meal or, or watch something that you want to watch. You just you know you've got to sort of give yourself time to to get out of that pessimism that you find yourself in. When did you leave the police force? Wow, well, I left that. When was that? Nineteen? No, two thousand. I joined in nineteen eighty nine. Left in two thousand. Mm. And what did you do after that? Um, I well, I I had to leave the police force. Well, in the end, I didn't have to, but mm. I, I got beaten up um, oh. and got epilepsy from it. So mm. I think for the first after my first seizure, which happened around nine months after my assault, mm. um, I was told that I was likely having a, a had a brain tumor, and um, but they couldn't pick it up in any of the scans. And, mm. So I was going back every three months to have more scans done, and it wasn't until I reckon six months after my first seizure that they told me that uh, it was likely epilepsy caused from some scarring on the assault that happened. It was a king hit, a bit like uh, David Hooks yep. back in the day. And you, are you still epileptic? Yes, I, I, I thought I was cured, um, and I stopped taking my medication a few years back, and, mm. um, and uh, yeah, I had a seizure at work, and... Um, the neurologist had told me that the reason I hadn't had any more seizures was because the medication was doing what it was supposed to. Uh, so you're back on the meds? <laughs> I'm back on the meds now, yeah, that's right. Good, good. Now, when did you become a financial planner and why? Yeah, interesting. I, I, I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. And um, so when I had my first seizure, I, I had a young family. I, I, I needed to... To, to change careers because the, all the good stuff of being a cop, like driving cars fast and carrying a, a loaded firearm, probably weren't overly good in the hands of someone that had, had epilepsy. So I um, mm. went and did a, a mature age entry and uh, got into Adelaide Union and did a commerce degree. So yep. it was during that period, I'm not sure if um, your listeners remember, but back in the mid-90s there was a, a re retire invest scam. And a what, sorry? Investigators. It was called the retire investor scam. Yeah. It involved um, a stock, couple of stockbrokers, mm -hmm. and um, it was in the mid '90s. And I was one of the, uh, the detectives on the case. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it was at that point that I realised that I liked the concept of helping people with money because the people that I was talking to, the victims, they really valued what they got, but mm -hmm. just did obviously didn't like what happened. And I suppose for me, as a, as a, as a detective, you know, I, I'd locked up. Mm. doctors and teachers and, and the like. And I, I realised that there's always bad apples in no matter which mm. profession mm. You, you choose to work in. So, yeah, it just took a natural course that way for me. And you enjoy it? I love it. I, uh, I love solving puzzles and I, I really do enjoy um, giving people permission to, to spend their money, wisely that is, but <laughs> to go and enjoy themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> because... I always think that you're only one doctor's appointment away from being really disappointed about the rest of your life, yes. and mm. you, know, you don't want to you don't want to perhaps spend it all at the start, but you want to pace yourself and you want to be able to have fun. And, and sometimes people live in fear of you know, outliving their money, and to be able to help them and see the smile on their face when they they can buy the car or go on a go on a trip somewhere, perhaps local at the moment, but uh, you know what I mean. Back mm. in the back in the time when you could travel. And you've been working um, at Mary Potter at the hospital. I, yeah, look, at, at Calvary, there's a, there's a great bunch of oncologists there and they, they run um, seminars for recently diagnosed cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I got involved in that was because of my business partner, Katie. When, when she was first diagnosed, that's where she went. Mm -hmm. And they wanted a financial planner to come along and talk and we could actually, you know, talk about the elephant in the room, and, and that was me. So mm -hmm. I, I've been been there ever since. So I've been doing that for a bit over a decade. The, what do you, you know, when you? I mean, it's a place of enormous peace and palliation, isn't it, Mary Potter? Um, Look, it is. Mm. It, it really is, and I, I suppose I've thought about this myself. Um, you know, all these all this misery and grief around me, but I, but I get to know and I get to uh, commemorate. Um, people's anniversaries of the day that they died. Mm. And I remember sitting there with Katie one day and she said, Brett, I, I know where I'm going to die in this room mm. and I'm, I'm not going to go back home. I'm not going to see my house again. Mm. Um, and I'm just, I'm just waiting. And, 
Yeah, there is a there is a tranquility to it because I think at, at that point people have to have made peace with it, and they almost go out strong for those mm-hmm. that are grieving around them. Well, there's enormous support there and love. Oh, wonderful mm-hmm. people! Everyone there is just, uh, it's just so caring, and you know, I, I I don't know, it'd be a pretty tough job. They they get to very close to people for a very short period of time. And has it helped you, Brett, with your you know many losses, including the loss of your father as well? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, look, it definitely does, and it has. And uh, I suppose uh, ultimately, it happens to us all. I haven't met anybody that's beaten death, no. and and I don't think any of us will. But to to see to see the way people go out and, and to go with dignity mm. and to go, you know, whether you, you know, in a thousand years time, whether we, we got to 20 or, or, or 80 or a hundred, mm. um, in a thousand years, we're just, we're just dust. And so uh, to actually just accept it and there's nothing you can do. And, and just to, to, to go out with that dignity and set an example for mm. the people around you that uh, you know, this mm. is the way it needs to be done. It has helped me. Your name, Chateau, is it's uh, what's the, the ethnicity of it? Look, it's uh, originally French, uh, and it was oh. built as, as as in the French castle, the Chateau, and um, oh. many generations. Yes, and uh, many generations ago, apparently, uh, one of my relatives was trying to help Napoleon, and uh, they had to pack up the castle and, and, and nick across to Germany, and uh, they changed the spelling to, to the one that it is today. Because it's, it's sort of vaguely German, but not. That's right. I always get told that I'm Italian because yes. it ends in an O. <laughs> what, I have no idea. <laughs> what did you, What did your parents do in the Riverland? Uh, Dad was a school teacher, mm. and Mum, Mum for many years was a stay-at-home Mum, um, and then she ended up working um, for the government in um, family and youth services. And what was it like growing up there? It's fantastic. Uh, there's, there's, I don't think there's any better than um, being born and bred in a country where there's. Uh, Fresh air. Look, I suppose the fact that I had a, a very nice family um, nucleus um, was a good thing. Mm. Um, we lived on a fruit property, but being able to get involved in sport and and mm. you know, mm. perhaps it, perhaps it's different today. I don't know. We, we didn't have the internet, and uh, you know, if you wanted to make a call to the girlfriend, you had to sit on the um, you sit on the stool in the kitchen so that everybody could hear. <laughs> um, not like it is today. <laughs> and how do you remember your boy, who was so sadly taken from you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Jordan, it's um, look. He was he was obviously back then. He was the my oldest, and you know uh, we had him at such a young age, and mm. you know in in some ways at the time it felt like a not a sacrifice because you know you would never change it again. But it, it changed you at a very young age, at mm. twenty two, and then to to lose him at nine. I just remember his energy, um, the things that he wanted to do, and I remember. Mm. Uh, a month before he died, we, we were in Renmark, and um, I was walking through the fruit property with my father, and mm. and Dad said, "Look, when I when I die, I want to be cremated and have my ashes scattered mm. a- around the trees." And Jordan asked, "Now, what's what's that mean?" And he said, "Oh, it's where you get burnt." And uh, Jordan said, "Look, I I don't want that." Mm. And my dad said to him, oh, "Look, I don't I don't want to be buried." Um, and explain why. And, and in the end, Jordan said, uh, well, actually, I want to be cremated too. And I, I said at the time, it's, you'll be cremating me, son. And, um, mm. you know, four weeks later, oh. we cremated him. Well, Brett, it's it's an extraordinary story. And, and you're, you are a person of resilience. And I wish you well in your work. And I thank you very much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me, Peter. Good on you, Brett Shutter.